Hello and welcome to this video which is going to be a revision summary for the first section of the AQA P3 syllabus and this is for the medical application of physics. Um, now if you're one of my students or you've watched my videos you're probably going to be sick of me saying this but I'm convinced the best way for you to revise is by doing the exam papers, looking at the mark schemes and learning what the examiners want. I've made a load of videos for you going over the exam papers these are the notes that I used while making the exam papers. I put them all together in one video for you here. I've had to add very, very little to these notes um, for making this video. So everything that I'm telling you here has come up in the exam paper before. So I'm going to try and keep this as concise as short as possible because this is a summary. Um, if there's anything you don't understand, I've put the name of the video where I explain it fully for you up here. And you can go back and look for those if you want more information or if you don't understand something. So the first thing you need to know for this is the structure of the eye. We have the optic nerve which goes to the brain here. The retina, that's the black bit that covers the whole of the inside of the eye. The cornea, this is the clear bit that's all around the outside. This is quite hard and tough, really, really tough to get anything through. The pupil, this is the black bit you can see in the eye. The iris here, this is the coloured bit. The lens, that changes shape. The ciliary muscles on either side, which connect the suspensory ligaments to the eye. So this is what they do. The lens and the cornea work together to focus the light. The lens changes shape. The cornea does quite a lot of work focusing the light. The pupil, this is the bit that lets the light into the eye. When the amount of light that actually gets in is controlled by the iris. The retina, this is where the image is formed. Now you probably should know that the image actually formed in the retina is an inverted image and our brain's really clever and turns this the correct way up for us. The suspensory ligaments connect the eye to the ciliary muscles and the ciliary muscles are what control the shape of the lens. So if they're contracted, is a short, is a fat, powerful lens and if they're relaxed, is a thin, less powerful lens. You're going to be, um, you could be asked some of the similarities between an eye and a camera. So they both have converging lenses. A real image is formed in both situations both form an inverted image and the amount of light entering can be controlled. And this one here, they have it down as a similarity, but personally I think it's different. On the eye, the image is formed on the retina, and in the camera, the image is filmed on a the image is formed, sorry, on a film or a CCD. A film is a char a CCD, sorry, is a charge coupled device. This is what you get in digital cameras these days. So there are two types of lenses that you need to know, converging and a diverging lens. These can also be called a convex lens and a concave lens. Uh, converging lens has this shape. Another annotation you might see for it, which you should know, is this. This is the shape of a diverging lens and the alternative annotation is here. So you need to know how to correct vision. In long sightedness, the image doesn't form on the retina, it forms behind the retina. And you can put a converging lens in front of it to bring the image forward so it actually focuses on the retina. If this comes up in an exam question, you have to draw your line so it's really clear there's a convergence event here and a convergence event here as well. The examiners will be looking for this. Alternatively, in short-sightedness, the image forms in front of the retina, so you need to put a diverging lens in front of it so the image actually forms on the retina. So these are a number of lens diagrams. Um, there are some very, very simple rules that you can follow uh, for drawing lens diagrams. The type of image that you'll form, whether it's on this side or this side, really depends on where the object is in relation to the focal point. So this is an example of converging lens and this is actually a magnifying glass. So very briefly, the rules, and I do go through this in great detail in my video on lenses and exam practice. You draw a line from the top to the lens through the focus point and down, from the top through the middle of the lens and down. Now these two lines are never going to meet up, so you need to track them backwards and this is traditionally done with a dashed line. And then where the lines meet, this is the object. Now this image is the right way up, it is larger and it is a virtual image because it's on this side of the lens. 
This is a diverging lens here. Same rules, ever so slightly different. From the top of the image straight across and then away, going through this focal point. From the top of the image, through the middle of the lens and where they cross, that's the top of the image. Again, here we have a converging lens, but the object is much further over here. So from the top of the lens, across, down through the focal point. From the top of the lens, through the, from the top of the object, sorry, through the middle of the lens, down. And where these points cross is going to be the top of the image. This is inverted, it is real, and it is smaller. You need to know how to calculate power and focal length. This is the equation that's on the formula sheet. This is power of a lens, not to be confused with electrical power, and this is measured in diopters. Then you just have one divided by the focal length, which is in meters. Sometimes in the exam, they might give you a number which is in centimeters. You have to convert this into meters. Easily done, just divide it by 100, but make sure you have the right units. Magnification. Magnification is worked out by dividing image height by the object height. Now there are a few ways they can do this. They could give you some squares, which you just count. There are no units for this, so you don't need to worry about it. And you don't need to use negative numbers. So it's probably going to be counting the number of squares, or you can use a ruler to measure it. This is just another example with some numbers plugged in. So the image height divided by the object height, and then no uni units needed for this. You want to be thinking about, is it a virtual image or a real image? Is it larger or smaller? And is it the correct way up or is it inverted? Refractive index. So this is our block of plastic, um, glass or water. As a ray comes in, when it changes from a slow to a fast or a fast to a dense, um, from a fast to a slow medium, it's going to change its speed. This happens when there's a change in density of the mediums and the rays get refracted. This is our normal here, our angle of incidence and our angle of reflection. You um, need to know that these are measured against the normal and whenever you're drawing rays, put the uh, direction of light on with arrows so you can, the examiner can see where the ray is coming from. There are two equations for refractive index. Refractive index is one over the sine of C, C being the critical angle, or is refractive index, which is the sine of length of incidence divided by the sine of the angle of refraction. So here are some numbers just to plug in for you to have a go. Remember, always show your working because if you make a mistake putting these numbers into a calculator, as long as the examiner has seen what you've done, you could still get one or maybe two marks. And the same, if you forget your calculator, show your working so the examiner might be able to give you some marks. So now we move on to some of the actual medical applications of physics here. This is about ultrasound and x-rays. So up here we have x-rays. You need to know that they are electromagnetic waves. They are transverse waves, which are very ionizing. They are high frequency, high energy, and have a short wavelength. In fact, their wavelength is the same diameter as an atom. Ultrasound, you need to know that is above 20,000 Hertz, which is way above human hearing, and it's a longitudinal wave. Now, x-rays are going to be used for looking at uh, potential broken bones. The uh, dense material, the bone, actually stops the x-rays getting through, whereas the, the, the fleshy bit, the muscles, um, allow the x-ray to go through so that on the film or charge couple device in um, digital x-ray machines these days, you get an image where the bones look white and everything passing through the skin, the tissue, the muscle looks black. Um, ultrasounds, um, this is when we have a boundary and there's change between a fast and a slow medium. You're going to have partial reflection and some of it's going to be reflected. There's going to be an oscilloscope which can look at the, the boundaries and can tell you the um, distance between these boundaries. Ultrasounds can also be used for treating kidney stones and x-rays can be used for treating cancer. You need to know that x-rays are very ionizing and they increase the chance of a mutation. Now I've underlined chance here because in P3 they're really going to be picking up on your language. It is only the chance of a mutation that is increased. Now a chance of a mutation could lead to damaged cells which could lead to cancer. 
So someone giving you an x-ray is going to be wearing a lead apron and they're going to be standing behind the screen because the x-rays could potentially damage and kill cells and any escaped x-rays are going to get um, picked up by the screen and the screen in the lead apron keep a radiographer safe. A CT scan is a very, very large, very, very fancy x-ray. So whereas an x-ray can only look at a small part of your body, CT scans are used for looking at whole bodies and they produce a 3D image on a computer. This can be manipulated so it can be looked at sideways, so you can have slices, so it can be looked at upside down and the doctor can get a much better picture of what's going on. The ultrasound is going to come up on an oscilloscope like this. You're going to have boundaries and you're going to have, if this is the ultrasound going in, some's going to be reflected at this boundary, some's going to be reflected at the second boundary. And the distance, the difference in time between these two will allow you to work out the um, distance. So this is the equation that we have, distance in meters, time in second, and speed in meters per second. I've seen something a bit weird in the mark schemes about this and the examiners don't just like you writing down this equation. So if this does come up, can you write down the full equation using the words for me please? Um, so reflection can be used um, in an endoscope where total internal reflection takes place. Total internal reflection will happen when the angle of incidence is bigger than the critical angle. And this is our endoscope here and the light just bounces through it. When you have surgery, it could be um, a surgery using an endoscope and a very, very thin fiber will have two optical fibers inside it. One with the light going in, one with the light going out. This is hooked up to an eyepiece, could also be hooked up to a computer so the doctor can see what's going on. The advantage of using this is that it's a very, very small cut, a very small incision site, which is going to lead to lower rates of infection because there's less chance of the bacteria getting in there. There's going to be less blood loss and there's going to be a smaller scar.